Hello and welcome to the February 7th Moving Monolithic Applications to Kubernetes Community Call. Uh, I am your host, Chris Nova, and I, I'm trying to do a good intro, it's not working out. Uh, we'll start off today, we'll, we are going to do intros from everybody here. Uh, the rule that we've been sticking with is that if you have your video turned on, that's our way of knowing that you're going to participate actively in the call, so we're going to make you give a quick intro and say hi to people who have joined us before. Also helpful to set context, what you're looking to get out of the call and why you're here. If you want to share any of that, feel free to. So I'm Chris Nova, I'm hosting these because it's a problem in Kubernetes and I want to try to fix it. Um, going in order of what's on my screen, Chris Short, you're next. I'm Chris Short, I'm a senior DevOps advocate for SJ Technologies and I am here to figure out how best to get other people to migrate their big monolithic apps to containers in Kubernetes as well. Uh, when I say other people, I mean banks and automotive industries, because uh, I'm in Detroit. Okay, Doug Fish, you're next. Hi, I am a IT architect at uh, Mayo Clinic, and I'm here because I will be helping some other groups decide how to um, migrate their applications, and I wonder to understand um, what will go wrong if they try to migrate them without refactoring or what refactoring they might want to consider. Awesome. Mike Lange. Hi, you're muted. We'll move on. Uh, Josh Hull. Hey everybody, Josh Hull, Principal Cloud Architect at NBC Universal. Uh, my life is monoliths, um, so this is a great fit for me. Awesome. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but welcome. It's not a good thing. But <laughs> <I'm happy. laughs> uh, John Harris. I am a solutions architect for Docker, based in Seattle. Um, moving things to containers is kind of my job. Um, so I'm an interested observer slash contributor. Awesome. If you ever want to get together and grab coffee or join us here at the office for one of these calls, we would love to, uh, to meet up. That would be awesome. Thank you. I'll ping you. Sure. Uh, who else? I don't see any more. Oh, we have one. Uh, Noel. Your video is on. If you want to share, give us an intro. Feel free. If not, we can move on. Or er, Marky Jackson, who's going to keep his hey. video off, but he's turning it on to tell me that he's <laughs> Hey guys, this is Marky. I'm with at and I work on the Kubernetes runtime for all of at and That's Spectrum, DirecTV, uh, you name it, anything under I work for that. Uh, I'm here to help. I'm also here to learn. And uh, thanks for having me, Chris. Absolutely. Sneak that. Oh, I'm try these. That's why. Sorry. Okay. Anybody else want to jump in and say hi and introduce themselves? Feel free. Now's a good time. <coughs> Uh, oh, yeah, you I'm Dan, I'm Arjun from uh, FTO, I'm head of products here and very interested in understanding uh, the challenges with modern pick apps. Awesome. Uh, so I'll put the Google Doc in the chat for those of you who don't have it. Um, same protocol as always. Use notes, there are notes. If you uh, want to assign something to me or somebody else, feel free to. Notes are everybody's responsibility, so if you hear something you like or want to remember, please add it there. Um, don't feel obliged to sign in, although it does help us understand who is getting the most out of these calls, if you want to add your name. And if there's anything you would like to talk about, feel free to add it to the agenda section. We'll go through the agenda, top to bottom, and when we get done, we're done. Uh, so last week, we had somebody um, lift from Slack. I don't know, I don't know the mapping. Okay, Josh, Josh Hole is the Lyft person. Um, bring up how long is too long to run a pod in production? Um, and before we get into the actual hands-on part of the call, I do think it's important to have some more philosophy discussions because I think we, we've been getting a lot out of these talks in the past two calls. So maybe we could spend the first few minutes here um, talking a little more theoretical. Uh, so Josh, if you want to jump in and maybe like, say the problem statement or I can read what you have here. Sure, um, in a nutshell, we are in a situation where Kubernetes is too stable. Um, you know, in previous environments with virtual machines, there were very clear roles uh, and operational procedures 
for how logs and monitoring occurred, right? At the infrastructure level, you have a certain level of logs and monitoring, and at the application level, you have a certain level of logs and monitoring. What we ran into in production was that our pods were stable enough that they were dumping application logs to the nodes on which the containers were running and consuming all of the local storage as a result, um, eliminating the value of the node and making it uh, very brittle. So I know that there are uh, similar approaches to um, Chaos Monkey, there's Chaos Cube, interested to see what the community has done to identify the best age for a pod or if there's an automated approach folks are using to ensure pods don't get brittle over time or write longer or greater logs than they should be writing. Um, so that's kind of the, the impetus for that agenda item. Okay, so I'm hearing we, uh, we have a system that's relatively healthy. The pods are doing what we want them to do like all systems go. But because of this healthy system, we're actually creating an unhealthy system downstream because the pods are using so many system resources on the underlying infrastructure. That's right. So to me, this like the high level snippet that we need to kind of like pay attention to here is how do we monitor nodes and how do we take action based on these, this arbitrary monitoring of these nodes. Because like, if we were to look at this in, through the eyes of a traditional systems administrator, we would have like a Nagios check that would just, you know, DF minus H, uh, look and see, like everybody's shaking their head like, yeah, we've done this before. Uh, look and see how much uh, disk space is filled up. And if it's like, you know, above 80%, we do some quick algebra. Um, let's shoot an email off to someone or like, let's, let's do something, let's take action. So in Kubernetes, there's like two, Layers. There's monitoring your pods, which is like application land layering, and then there's this other layer that we're talking about now. I don't have a good solution. Like a lot of people say Prometheus, a lot of people here at Heptio say Prometheus. I really think we should give it the Pepsi challenge and try to set up a Prometheus cluster on one of these calls. Um, but I think there's also a lot of other approaches here. I think we could explore. Um, but I think I think the the pattern is how do we keep an eye on our nodes and how do we take action when something goes wrong or we detect something needs to change. And I also included this as an agenda item because it's a real world example of how roles are shifting over time, right? Previously, someone who was in charge of the infrastructure would be offering a Tomcat build for the application developer to inject their uh, artifact onto, right? But now because Tomcat has been extracted out of the infrastructure and placed within the process, the ownership of that seems to have waned or uh, you know it's not that anyone is trying to drop the ball it's just that the awareness of where that administration occurs is now different so I think we were talking about roles before and I did want to introduce this because you're right I don't think that there's a hard and fast rule for when pods should get nuked um, especially if they're stable uh, but as we see folks shifting in their definition of the work that they do, we're definitely noticing in production um, items like this normally would have been caught, right? But weren't. Yeah, absolutely. I think the paradigm shift of whose responsibility is it to watch the nodes versus to watch the pods is a really, really interesting topic that we should explore. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen the new doc site, Kubernetes.io released a new uh, like revamp of our document here. I, I think I could do a screen share and actually show you guys uh, how do I do this? Screen share. Bam. Share my screen. Um, can you guys all see that? I'm going to take silence as compliance and say yes. So here we have these three like sort of roles. Like I'm a user and I'm either a cluster operator or an application developer. And the docs are sort of structured for these different types of people who would be looking at Kubernetes. But also in contributor, we have these three other types of contributors as well. I think it would be meaningful to take these sort of personas and start to like just kind of like use them as like shared vernacular on these calls. Yeah? So in the case of node monitoring, whose job is it going to be to I'm going to say take full responsibility of watching one of these nodes, which is everything from nuking a pod if it's becoming a problem, 
all the way to detecting that the disk, the volume is filling up on the node to potentially scaling nodes if we need to like burst our amount of pods horizontally. To me, that fits under cluster operator. What do you guys think? Um, yeah, I agree. Which is, I mean, it's, it seems to make sense because that person's sort of like an operator, like an operations-minded person. But then again, at the same time, it also kind of like relieves responsibility of the app developer. Like they kind of don't have to care about this stuff anymore. Like that's somebody else's problem. I'm wondering if we're introducing like a case of like throw the ball over the fence and now it's out of my yard so I don't have to care about it kind of situation. Well, if you're telling the app developer to worry about uh, cluster performance, you're kind of, <clears throat> here's a better one. Since, since I do DevOps, cluster operator and application developer should probably sit right next to each other anyway. Okay. So they're supposed to collaboratively work on this. Like there should never be a point where it's like, hey, we're deploying this new thing and the operator would never know about it. Yeah. So I don't know if this, if, if this is a like functional problem or a Kubernetes problem. I have like so, uh, the matrix causes the complexity and adds to the problem. Technically, it's not difficult to solve for, but uh, identifying who owns what and when and why I think is now the new uh, challenge. Totally. If we and if we can come up with like a model, you know, maybe we base it off the docs. Maybe we start from scratch. Maybe we like do a hybrid of both. <laughs> If we can come up with a model that kind of works for us and we can kind of sanity check it as we go through these calls, I think that's probably a pretty valuable piece of data to at least be like, hey, you know, we got a group of people together in the wild and Chris was playing the role of the cluster operator and she handled, you know, A, B, and C. And that seemed to be like a, a meaningful workflow for everyone that worked well or did not work well, and here's why. Okay. Um, so in that case, I would propose... Later on in the call, when we move, we, we move over to actually trying to containerize this application and run it, um, we take volunteers to play the roles of these different people. And we can talk about who's responsible for doing what in this process. <coughs> yeah? Yep. Okay. I'm going to make you guys go into the team. I think that's a good <laughs> idea. Okay. Agreed. Okay, so who's going to be our app developer? I'm happy to play that role because I wrote the app. <laughs> okay. Which means. Yeah, I hear it. Okay, who's going to be the uh, cluster operator then? I can. Who, who said that? That's Marky. Marky, okay. Marky, are you going to be able to possibly do a screen share if needed? Is this for today? Yeah. Chris, are we talking about doing this today? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, I won't be able to do it because I'm driving. Okay. Okay. You can be a cluster operator next time. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other volunteers? Okay. I'm going to pick someone. <laughs> Chris Short, I pick you. I figured you would. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um. Okay, and then I think in the name, like to answer the question that Josh brought up concretely, like how long should we run a pod? I think the answer is like, as long as we can, giving the other systems in place will let us know when that becomes a problem. Also, I think it's probably just a good exercise in general to like have confidence that you can go and nuke one of these pods and that your system's not gonna break. Like, I think just in general, it should just be kind of like a familiar thing, just as a cluster operator, like, oh, it's Monday morning, I'm gonna like sit down at my desk and I'm gonna kill a pod. Just to like kind of reassure me that that's okay and that's safe. Um, I think that's kind of like a good practice to get into, just so that like, we're not treating these pods as like nice secret little pets that are gonna run for super long periods of time. We do want them to be ephemeral. And I should know this, but when a pod is deleted, is the underlying storage allocated to that pod recycled or reclaimed, or does that artifact remain? 
it, it's totally sorry artifact remains depends okay. on what your retention policy is or is a recycle or I know that that's true for uh, volume claims, for persistent volumes and whatnot, but if it's an empty dir associated with an application that is local to the node on which the pod is running, is there a reclaim policy specific to empty dir? It's my experience that it's not, that the only thing that will remain will be the image that you put on that node. Anybody can correct me if I'm wrong. Unless we have persistent volume, that's my understanding as well. Excellent, okay. So in theory, just by coming in on Monday and nuking pods and hoping that we don't you know, nuke production in the process, we should be alleviating some of that storage concern. Um, you know, in theory, again, that's what programmatically we could do with Chaos Monkey, but uh, running that in production is usually pretty career limiting. Yeah, and we, and we want to get we want to make sure that we're doing this in the name of introducing confidence as ourselves as operators, and not in the name of. of doing the wrong thing to keep our systems healthy. Like we've all heard the story of like the systems administrator who like restarts the crowd manager every Tuesday morning and for whatever reason when they do that the system stays healthy and then they quit and then nobody's resetting the crowd manager and the whole system breaks. Like we don't, we don't want to be in that pattern where we're doing weird things for the wrong reason. Right. Yeah. Maybe one thought along those lines, though, is uh, one of the things I'd imagine we might do is uh, in, in like a development or integration environment or during a testing phase, very regularly destroy pods, not only for us from a kind of an operations perspective to know that it works, but also for developers to help them recognize that, oh, I've been storing state on my you know, lo local, uh, local storage that's going away, for example, or other problems that they might not identify. Yeah, that's a good point. Interestingly enough, we never ran into a consumption issue outside of production because we were cycling pods far more frequently during the software development life cycle. But once we had the stable pod and we released it, we had very little reason to cycle them and that's where we saw the consumption. I wonder also if you should be uh, doing your logging in a different way. If there's, a, if there's another alternative rather than writing to the host uh, disk. Right, so that does bring up a very interesting point. Everyone wants their uh, logging and monitoring application of choice for a large organization like ours. We have Splunk, we have New Relic, we have Sysdig, all of which are just consuming like mad, which, you know, if you think about it, there's duplicates of these logs everywhere, and there shouldn't be. There should be a source of record that the pod itself is dumping to, and then all of them can read it like you would read a view of a database. Yeah. Ideally, they should have persistent volumes. The persistent volume becomes a, that becomes your source of truth and that way it's always replicated in case of dying. Yep. That's what we do at AT&T. So everything gets replicated onto a persistent volume for logging. So if a client says I have X microservice or monolith for this case, I want all my logging that to go to this persistent volume. We know that that's always going to be there. We always have a source of truth to go back to. That also brings up another interesting agenda item we might want to add for the future, and that is how do we behave uh, inheriting a cluster that's already in place and in production versus building a cluster that we want to run in production in the future. Um, some of these decisions were made before I joined, and I inherited those decisions and those operating procedures. So I don't think folks will often be in a situation where they have greenfield across the board, especially with legacy apps. Is there some, when you inherit those, is there some sort of matrix that you go off of to say, here's what the policy A, B, and C is, and this, this is different from mine, and here's maybe a roadmap to integrate into my policy? Do you guys do that? I am working through that with all new clusters that we're putting into the environment. With some of these older ones, it's to the uh, extent where we can't even auto scale effectively. So trying to get them offline as quickly as possible is limiting the ability that I have to document fully. Yeah, see what we've done, like at at and I've run across some super old clusters. I actually have one particular Kubernetes version that's on 1.2. Nice. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah, wow. right. I know, right? Yikes. And, but the client will knock it off of it. I can't crow, crowbar it away from them. What I've now started doing is, is I personally have taken upon myself to build them a new cluster and start migrating their applications over and saying, just play with this. Mm -hmm. 15 minutes a day, play with it. And I've created a regular touch point with them where I'm saying, all right, how did that playing go? 
okay, well, you have application A. Do you think we can maybe move that over here? You just got to get their buy-in. And I think a lot of it comes from getting people comfortable, right? Because they're scared. And if you just get them comfortable, then they're like, you know, all right. And you give them a hug and you pat them on the butt and send them back away. Right. Yeah, Maybe it's very on simple board. on more uh, recent releases, uh, even using uh, Heptio's fantastic arc tool. To <laughs> literally do a snapshot and move it over. Uh, <laughs> shameless plug for you guys there. Um, but prior to that, right, uh, 1.2, 1.5, it's impossible to just do a quick lift and shift without identifying all the manifests, ensuring they can run in a new or different environment, and then trying to determine what is codified versus simply you know, cube control, edit, blah, um, which yeah. I run into a lot. What I've done from a business perspective is, is I've started saying, hey, this is what it costs to support this cluster. Right? Yeah. And this is this is killing us. And, yeah. you know, if you want to continue paying us, we'll continue chargebacks. Maybe having that non-technical decision with the business leaders can kind of help with that. But maybe not. It's different for every situation. I can only speak from my own experience. Right. Frequent outages are helping me too. Yeah. And if you can document that and give people like, hey, here's what I've done the last 30 days. Right. Awesome. Okay. Um, we get there. Do we want to move on to taking a look at an app and Getting hands on keys. Let me take that as a yes. Yes, sorry. Oh, you're good. You're good. Um, so I'm going to ask the question, but I don't know how deep down this rabbit hole we want to go, but it, it has the potential to kind of get out of hand. Um, but in order for us to move this Java application um, to Kubernetes, we're going to need Kubernetes up and running. Uh, does anybody? Is anybody going to find any value out of going down that rabbit hole and talking about the different avenues, or do we just want to bypass that for the call and bring that up later in a different space? I, I think the question that is at bar is whether or not this is a sponsored cluster or the community is going to share the cost of running it. I mean, I think for right now, for the sake of the call, we can spin it up in Heptio's Amazon. We're happy to take the cost, and if like, if I need to give Chris short like SSH keys or because he's the cluster operator for the call, like I, I, that works for me. Perfect. I don't really see this being like a long running cluster, although I guess it has the potential to become one. Okay, I'm gonna just spin up a really simple one nine cluster with Keep a Corn in Amazon, <laughs> if that works for everyone. Right. Cool. And why? Why I do that, I'm going to share my screen. Um, I'm also going to kind of show you guys what we have running. Um, this app that I wrote is actually running like in real virtual machines that really talk to a real database on real Linux servers. It's pretty exciting. Um, so, Um, what we have, let's see, how do I get this out of my way? There we go. We have two virtual machines that are currently running in Amazon, which I don't know why we're not showing any virtual machines here. Oh, do your, yeah. That is, it, is that thing again? Scroll down. There you go. I don't know why it does that. Okay. So we have this top one. We have Java prototype. It's at T2 micro. So super small instance that like, I can really only run the Java app on there, like for about 10 minutes before it breaks and it runs out of memory. Uh, and, and that's because of like, we'll go into what the app is doing in a second, but it like, it kind of bloats itself and then shrinks itself like for memory allocation over time. And eventually one of those bloated cycles will get so big it'll, it'll crash the app. Um, we also have like a Bitnami MySQL instance. Uh, the MySQL instance has a publicly resolvable URL and 3306 is open to the world. Also, 
this is a horrible setup, like just totally disclosing this right now, but I kind of felt like we should start with a horrible setup because honestly, people might be doing some of this in the wild. And if we're going to find any problems, it's going to be starting this way. So yeah, so MySQL is open to the world. Uh, the Java prototype app is open on port 8080 and port 22. Uh, 8080 is what the app is listening on as for an HTTP server, and port 22 is how we can SSH into this thing. The MySQL virtual machine does not store its MySQL binary data on an independent volume. It's storing the data on the same drive that the rest of the operating system is on. Um, as far as the app, goes, I can show you guys what it's kind of like to run it locally. Um, can everybody see my terminal? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Do I need to make it bigger or are we good? Make it bigger, please. Okay. Same one. You're good. Okay. Uh, so I wrapped up some Maven commands and a makefile. If we want to look at the makefile, it's like really simple. All we're going to do is we're going to do build run which is gonna say made and clean package, and then we're gonna run the, uh, the jar file, and we're gonna listen on port 8080. Uh, so if we do that, it's a Spring Boot app, so it's gonna go through like the normal Java E Spring Boot build process, then it's going to start to run the application, we're gonna bootstrap the app, and if all goes well, yeah, we should get here, and every few seconds, we should see our logs spit out some information about how many threads are running, how much memory is available um, on the system, and how much free memory is available on the system. Uh, so what's happening in the background is there's this like, I call it the noisy application controller, but it's basically just a, a Java class that will spawn off multiple Java threads, stick some uh, garbage data into a cache in memory. Uh, the thread will die and the Java JVM garbage collector gets to try to keep up and have fun with it. And it does it chaotically, so every time we create one of these threads, it'll, be, it'll sleep for some undetermined amount of time. So this whole behavior is undeterministic. No two runs will ever be the same, and it should synthesize a production app pretty well. Uh, the other component that the app is doing, other than just bloating itself in memory, is it's also an active HTTP server. So if we hit localhost here on 8080, um, Oh, it's hanging real bad. Smell. It's hanging real bad already. <laughs> okay. Uh, there we go. We have success. Okay. And what's super exciting is behind the scenes, it actually wrote synchronously and both asynchronously to a MySQL database on the HTTP request. And we can see that here if we open up uh, our handy dandy pancakes app we can connect to the Java prototype, get requests table, and you can see right now we have 198 rows in the table. If I refresh, we should get 199 for the synchronous request, and then we should go up to 200 uh, sometime between one and 10 seconds later for the asynchronous request that will follow. Uh, we'll do it once here, and then we'll do it once again, and we can watch the logs. So we'll run it here, uh, it's loading, and that was successful. And if we refresh our table, we're going to look at this number down here at the bottom. It should be 200 now. Very, very good. And if we look in our logs, uh, I'm going to scroll down and give us some white space or black space. You should be able to see uh, this is the garbage data for the synchronous request. And then if we're patient, we should see another one. Yep, there it is. The other one came through asynchronously after the request returned. Uh, doesn't really accomplish anything good, but there's a lot of interesting things here that can potentially break as we start trying to plug this thing up in, uh, in Kubernetes. Okay, does anybody have any questions or ideas of how to make this thing more annoying or interesting things they would like to add to the program moving forward? Cool. No, that's good. I think this is awesome. Okay, I, I'm super proud of this. I'm not gonna lie. Writing this last night and getting null pointer exceptions and uh, Java heap exceptions was was a lot of fun. So 
this is uh this is like synthesizing me in the conference room demoing my app to the rest of the company um and here oh yeah uh, we just got <laughs> uh, out of memory error um which is great so so the app is brittle um and we're going to make it even more brittle by running it on one of these small ec2 instances um but hopefully we can get the app up and running in the cloud and you guys at home should be able to uh actually curl this endpoint and talk to our app. For realism, as soon as it starts to fall over, we should all be paged or called by executives asking why our service is failing. So yeah, I mean, right now we're all getting paged. Like our pager duty is blowing up. Yeah. And it's probably like two in the morning on Christmas. <clears throat> okay. So let's SSH into the server. Let me zoom in. Can you guys see this okay? Yep. Um, I want to make sure nothing's running. Okay, cool. Uh, so we should have our Java prototype repo checked out. Um, we are a commit behind and we have a modified file on the file system. Um, because, you know, this is production. Like, literally, I've seen this I don't know how many times in prod, so I figured this would be a good synth uh, way to synthesize that. And all I did is I changed the values of the noisy application controller to something a little bit smaller so it can run on this piece of micro. It just doesn't cache as much data, so it doesn't use as much memory. It's perfect, isn't it? This is like just like real production. Um, <laughs> so anyway, if I run MakeDev, we should compile our app and start to run it. If you guys want to grab this IP address, uh, it's 52.34.110.154. And if you hit that on port 8080, I should be able to see all you guys here in our logs. Oh yeah. So we're kicking off synchronous rights to MySQL, asynchronous rights to MySQL. Uh, in the background, we're doing a bunch of weird multi-threading. We have less than 100 megabytes of free memory right now. This thing's about to crash. Let's see if we can make it crash. Damn. Hang on. Hang on. We're all jumping into our wild food do curl. <laughs> yeah. And I guess it doesn't have to crash now, but I just want to demonstrate that like it's a brittle application and that when it does crash kind of by design, like it's not gonna go back to stack. Like we don't get an exit code, the app doesn't really break, it just kind of freezes and hangs and is horrible. Which when we run that in a container in Kubernetes, we're going to see why that's a problem. Okay, well, why we let this thing run? Because it will inevitably break if we're just patient enough with it. Um, let's talk about our approach to, to migrating this production system, which is these two servers, to Kubernetes. What do you guys want to do first? Well, we need a cluster. We need somewhere to put it. We do need a cluster. <clears throat> mm. um, let's see what we have here. So I should have a master. Here we go. Let me grab our cube config. Nobody remember this ephemeral Kubernetes cluster secret. Recorded for posterity. Right. Poof. 
Oof, we have a cluster. Okay, what's next? Yay, cluster. Uh, let's get some. Are we, sorry, are we moving the database or not? Just got I, I don't know. What What do you guys think? Like, maybe on the first round we don't care about moving the database, but on the second round we start to look out at database database migration patterns. I'm cool with that. It's potential uh, to have a whole lot of mess with VPC peering, and you know, and if it's all within the same account, that's not going to be as representative of something that is, you know, very brittle and very old. If it's not RDS or something that's uh, provided as a service, so maybe move it into the cluster to begin with, and then look at using an external service afterward. So you're saying we want to try to replicate the data into the cluster? Um. Yeah, I mean, I'm open to suggestions, but I think that would be a good uh, exercise for sure. Okay. I've never done that before, but I'm down. Um, and honestly, right now at this point in the call, this is like what I hear all the time in the wild, which is like, what do you do at this point? So the fact that we're kind of here talking about it, I think is pretty handy. Um, okay, so let's let's be, uh, let's be diligent software engineers and let's come up with a, a list of action items we need to work on. I vote for installing Tiller and using Helm to deploy a stable MySQL chart. So you think, here let's, let's uh, go to the doc here. I'm going to call this our backlog, quote unquote backlog. So you think we can install Helm and install a stable MySQL? Mm -hmm. And then how are we gonna get our data, data from the real MySQL server to the new one in Kubernetes? We're gonna replicate. Woohoo, MySQL replication, here we come. <laughs> so we're gonna run the MySQL in Kubernetes as a slave? Initially, yeah, we can just grab the data that way. And then just turn the master off? Mm -hmm. That works, unless you get a better idea. Um, well, considering we have a live system and data is continuing to come in, I mean, all of the classic, like, take a snapshot, take a snapshot of the volume, take a snapshot of the database, none of this is really going to work for us. Yeah, you'll have so, endless deltas. Yeah. So replicating <laughs> is the best way, I think. I agree. I. I haven't replicated MySQL in like four years, you guys. It's okay. I'm going to be copying and pasting notes out of uh, <clears throat> Evernote for this. <laughs> okay, so let's do this. So, can we just do a master master replication? Would that work for us? Like like HA master? Yeah. Okay. Sure. What version of MySQL are we running? Do we is it supported? I thought that was a relatively new feature for MySQL. We're 5.6, so we should be okay. I'd have to check on that. Okay. 5.6 should be good. Yeah. Okay, so then we need to configure the new MySQL server as a master HA uh, replica. Okay, so that's the database bit. We'll need to install Helm and configure the new master server. Um, I think we also probably have to change something on the existing server, don't we? Yes. I mean, technically you can change it all in one place once you get authentication going, but that's fine, whatever. Okay. I, I just have a feeling there's going to be an exercise of SSHing into that EC2 instance and reloading daemons or something. Mm. No, I don't know. I don't think so. Okay. I don't think yeah. Well, I don't know. I've never done master master, but I know for just standard replication, I don't think you had to. We're about to find out. Yep. Okay. So for the app, we need to containerize our application. Right? And we need to 
deploy it to Kubernetes, probably as a deployment. Yeah? Yes. Or we could write the chart, depending on how we want to proceed. Well, so here's the thing, though. It's like we could use Helm, or we could just write standardized Kubernetes objects. I'm kind of like indifferent. I don't really care. If you guys want to get to go with Helm, that's fine for me. Um, can we do Jenkins? Yeah, yeah, we do Jenkins. I'm just throwing curveballs at everybody. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason I suggest Helm to deploy our application is that we would then be able to look at releases and roll back if we made mistakes and we weren't necessarily trying to manipulate a number of manifests once it gets large. Um, yeah. You know, replicate what's happening in the real world. The the more manifests we have to deal with individually, the less we want to not have a package manager of some sort. But that's my personal preference. My only reservation, like implicitly, when we have Tiller running, I don't think it bootstraps with TLS over gRPC by default. So there's a little bit of a security gap there. Um, so potentially introducing root on our like a root vulnerability attack vector on our cluster mm -hmm. i mean I, like this is like we're in the sandbox at this point so it's kind of okay but like i just want to call that out if uh if users are thinking about doing this in sort of real life right certainly recommend putting it into uh our back controlled tiller namespace right and not having it give access to the root access to the whole cluster does everybody understand what we just said I did. Okay. I just I want to make sure that like we're not jumping too far ahead if people are still kind of getting used to like basic Kubernetes primitives like namespaces and RBAC and stuff. Yeah, it, I'll rethink my statement. Let's leave it in a manifest for now. Let's get it working, and then if we want to put it in a chart later, someone can tackle that. Okay. I mean, I, I okay. Yeah. Let's just do that. Um, I'm familiar with RBAC, but what's Tiller exactly? Tiller is the server-side component of Helm. So you run Helm as a client, and um, it can either be run machine state uh, by Jenkins or some other CI tool, or it can be run by an operator. Um, but Helm is the client side, Tiller is the server side, and Tiller essentially creates the Kubernetes objects based upon Helm charts, where the charts determine manifests based upon templates. Gotcha, thanks. Hey, Chris, do we take into account, or, or to everybody, do we take into account if a, let's say, a large enterprise is it using Helm? Is that something we think about separately, or? What do you mean? But, let, like, did, let's say a company is just using Jenkins for their deployments. Do we okay. take, and they don't have Helm installed. Do we, do we take that into consideration, or do we just not worry about that for now? Well, so I, I think that was kind of what we were saying earlier with boiling this down to like the most common denominator, which is just a pure Kubernetes resource. Meaning, and like we could probably use Helm to install MySQL and then like get just to like get us up and running. Um, but like repackaging our app in Helm again, like that's, it's, it's a good exercise, but I don't know if it's going to be inclusive enough to all enterprise like not everybody can install tiller and install helm right that's exactly what i was getting at yeah so that's why i think like it's probably will behoove us to always speak the least common denominator as often as possible which in this case is just good old-fashioned kubernetes resource yaml files okay um so here, let's do this. We can do Helm. Uh, somebody needs to chartify this. And then we also can do Kubernetes resources. Um, we just want the basic YAML files. Uh, I feel like the first one is kind of a necessary like part of chartifying anything with Helm anyway. So like whoever gets this, I'm just gonna call it a card. Whoever gets that card, like we'll let the engineer decide what they want to do there. And then we can talk about pros and cons of their approach after afterwards. What does everybody think to that? Sounds good. Cool. Yep. Um, 
just because I think like no matter what, we're going to need to find the Kubernetes resources. And then if we try to find it, then we just template it out and add the higher level values that YAML in the home chart, which is not much extra work. Um, okay, so we'll basically need to represent our application um, using Kubernetes primitives. That's kind of what's really going on here. Um, and then deploy it and see what happens. Are we assuming the exposure of the application is included in the deployment? Yeah, I think so. I think the deployment should include the service and whatever ingress is necessary. Again, uh, I'm going to put that up to the discretion of the engineer who pulls that card just so that we have a starting point. I don't really think there's a right or wrong way of doing it, but like, let's start somewhere and then we can talk about different approaches and why we might do something differently. Perfect. Yeah, it will definitely lead into the discussion of whether it's exposed internally just to your organization or exposed to the public. Another thing I kind of like in secretly hoping happens is like whoever deploy, whoever sets up the uh, the application in uh, using Kubernetes resources, like they're going to have to pick a namespace. What namespace are they going to run in? They're going to have to like, oh, do we do a service? How do we route to it? Do we use KubeDNS? Like there's all of these things that are naturally going to come through the fabric here as we actually try to plug everything together. Um, the one other bit, moving on, if nobody else has anything out on deployment, um, as far as containerizing our application goes, like to me, the simple solution here is like have a big file, have a shell script that will Docker build and Docker push our image to some lowly software engineers, local Docker hub. Um, do we want to get proper CI/CD set up here? Do we want somebody to operate in Jenkins server or anything, or should we just keep it simple and start with like a shell script for now? I'd say keep it simple, simple. for now. I think I keep it simple, but I definitely think there should be a future thing to sort of expand on some subset to give people like something, you know, to arm themselves that they're going to face, right? In their organization, they're going to want proper CI CD. Right. And without CI CD, we won't have the pitfalls of saying, well, this environment's working just fine. Ah, oh, the classic developer statement. Exactly. Or loader stage, right? That has a beefier node running the application, whatever the case might be. Yeah, totally. Okay. Um, so here's my proposal. Um, we go through this sort of backlog we've created and we divvy up the work amongst all of us. I'm happy to take on anything that's going to involve spending money or uh, getting infrastructure up and running. And before the next call, we all have a working agreement to do as much as we can to getting our pieces we volunteer for done. And let's try to actually glue everything together on the next call. I'm game. I'm game. Perfect. Perfect. Sounds good. All right. Okay. Uh, we've all sat in a backlog grooming meeting before, so everybody has a cup of coffee. Uh, the first card is um, install Helm and install stable MySQL. So to me, this is like operator -y stuff, uh, which means implicitly I'm looking at you, Chris. <laughs> Yeah, you're smiling right now. You're my um, favorite, Chris. Chris. I'm all. I'm also happy to do this. Um, sure. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. That's fine. Okay. Cool. And then Chris Short, you can just ping me like on Twitter or Slack or whatever. I'll give you SSH keys and everything you need. And uh, I'll, I'll kind of let everybody know now as we approach the next call if any of the stuff has like for whatever reason needs a little bit more elbow grease i'll jump in and, and grab any loose ends so like this is not a hard commitment by any means like i'll still take ownership full ownership of all this stuff um i just kind of want to get to the point where like there's certain people who know certain things and like we're not going to be able to move forward unless we have the valuable knowledge that's in other people's brains because that's going to help us with the persona conversation too um Okay, so containerizing our application, this is gonna be like somebody needs to come up with some sort of process, like write a make file, write a shell script. That's gonna be a pull request to the repo. Any volunteers who's got awesome bash chops? I know we all do. 
So I have a PR with a rudimentary Docker file in place already, but I can certainly look at uh, doing a multi-stage Docker file or a shell script to um, invoke the builder. Okay, awesome. So I think uh, let's do success criteria on all three of these, just so everybody kind of knows like the bare minimum. Um, but I'll assign this one to you, Josh. Um, so success criteria for containerizing the application is we have some sort of executable that will build and push a Docker image to an arbitrary registry. Now, are we assuming that this is like most corporations where it has to be a private repo and we need to inject the secrets with uh, the repo credentials, or are we going to have this completely open and public? I mean, I, I definitely don't ever want to have secret information stored in plain text. Mm -hmm. I think for now, uh, going with like my approach of just like you have to define an environmental variable, and if that's not defined, then it just doesn't work. Fair enough. Yeah, I just want folks to understand the pain points that come about with trying to use private repos for our images because it's uh, significantly different from simply pulling, say, stable MySQL. Well. That's actually a really good point. And Joe just did a TGIK on this. Like private repos are kind of a pain in the ass. Um, let's let's do a private repo. Is that is that kosher with you guys? Are you okay with taking that on, Josh? No worries. Awesome. Yeah, let's do private repo. I like this idea. And I would like, like to get... copy that when you're done. <laughs> <laughs> we can get yeah. uh, we can get uh, cross host value there, right? We can throw it in GCR, and you know the nodes are running in AWS, and the images are being pulled from Google, and yeah. Lots of goodness. Cool. Um, another thing I wanted to remind folks is this repo, the Heptio repo, it's ours. We can do whatever we want to with it. Uh, so if you just for whatever reason feel inclined to open up GitHub issues or you want to write some documentation or this is our resource and ideally this will kind of like stick with us as we move through the process and hopefully become a tool that we can use to demonstrate, you know, the ins and outs of doing this uh, internally at our companies moving forward. Uh, so yeah, feel free to open up PRs, especially to the code. Like if you want to add some really horrible code that does some really crazy things, like that's just going to make our application better. So feel free to, to go crazy. Um, and then Chris Short, your uh, success criteria here is going to be, um, I have a MySQL server running in our new Kubernetes cluster with relatively accurate production data. Fair enough. Cool. <laughs> I mean, and like, there's going to be a little bit of a lag, like, as the bin logs replicate, but, like, you know, such is life. Okay, so deploy it to Kubernetes. This is a... Uh, who wants to go through and, and write a chart or write a uh, case on it configuration or, or write the YAML files or solve this however they want. Um, but basically start to map out which Kubernetes resources and primitives we're going to be using to represent our application. Any volunteers? Okay. Not it. <laughs> You know, I, I, I swore when I left Microsoft I would never write a Helm chart ever again in my career, but <laughs> looks like I'm going to be writing a Helm chart. You can use case on it if you want. I'm, I think that's a reasonable thing. Uh, knowing me, I'm probably going to find the hardest way possible that's going to introduce the most problems downstream just so that we make life hard for ourselves here. So I'll probably like write it in JSON or XML or something. Do it in XML. Yeah. <laughs> That sounds perfect. <laughs> okay, awesome. Uh, so deploy to Kubernetes. I'll take that on. Um, and my success criteria is going to be, I have Kubernetes primitives that will run my app and allow traffic to get to my app. So in my rudimentary Docker file, I do have a placeholder for an agent. Um, do we want to include logging and monitoring on our first pass, or is that a nice to have for a future release? No, that's a must have. I think I think YOLO, but let's. 
<laughs> let's get it in there. Um, so do we want to, does we want somebody want to take a fourth card? Or is that part of my card here? Um, we probably should decide what monitoring solution we want, whether it's open source or a paid solution, right? Most legacy applications are going to expect a enterprise class monitoring suite. Yeah. So why don't we, uh, why don't we make this one a spike? Yes. Somebody can take this home, noodle on it, decide that Prometheus is the best, come back on our next call and tell us all use Prometheus. Or whatever. <laughs> okay. Uh, awesome. So spike on logging and monitoring. But yeah, basically, just it doesn't have to be Prometheus. Obviously, I was just kidding. But you know, come to the next call. Like, I want to run this monitoring, and here's sort of what it's going to look like, and give us an idea of uh, how much effort it's going to be to get that up and running. Okay, who wants to take that one? You can give it to me. I couldn't get off mute quick enough for the other ones. <laughs> awesome. Could I? Okay, everybody has homework. Um, I know we have GitHub issues for these just so we can track things concurrently and publicly. So for everybody's first item, can they go and create a GitHub issue for their card? And I can assign it to everybody on GitHub um, afterwards. And that way, as we work, we'll at least leave a paper trail of what we're doing. Because I know there's going to be questions like, hey, Chris, what port does your app listen on? Or like, hey, Chris, you know, where can I uh, point my application to get to your MySQL server you just set up? Um, and doing that in GitHub makes sense to me. Chris, I don't know um, when you created with Kubicorn if the uh, auto scaling was set. Uh, is that something that we want to be declarative about for the application, either um, horizontal pod auto scaling or node auto scaling? I think that's a day two concern. I mean, there is the uh, launch configuration and auto scaler that's in place. So, like right now, I could go tweak a number manually and mm -hmm. our cluster would scale. But uh, I do think having an auto scaler in place, like, is going to be a natural thing we get to as our application starts running in Kubernetes. I definitely think it will add to the complexity of why it's not falling over sooner, right? It's trying to heal itself on the back end when the app itself is the problem. So uh, w once we get there, it's going to be a valuable exercise, I believe. Awesome. Yeah, I think so too. We have one minute um, left in our call. God, this thing flew by. Also, these calls are getting really exciting and productive. I'm really, really pumped about these. Um, Cool. Well, thanks for joining everyone. The call was recorded. I'll put it on YouTube. We all have homework. Uh, feel free to use the mailing list if anybody has questions or just thoughts or just want to say hi. And we'll see everybody in two weeks.